General Botha spent the first days of 1915 ferrying South African troops and supplies to build up his base at Walvis Bay. On January 14th at 5 a.m., the northern campaign began when Botha marched 30 kilometers and took the town of Swakop Moon without resistance. The Germans evacuated the town days before and took everything of value while poisoning the water wells. With no source of water, Botha had to once again build supplies. He had no idea exactly where the Germans were, but he knew the Namib Desert was between them and he would have to conquer that first. The South Africans found the Germans entrenched in the Langer Heinrich Hills, about 100 kilometers inland. This would become known as the Battle of Riet Fort Jackalswater. It began when Botha's forces ran directly into German artillery positioned on a hill called Riet. Rather than send his superior forces into slaughter, he probed the German position and his commandos found a weakness at another hill called Forte. The commandos were able to cut through the line and managed to destroy railroad tracks, which then isolated a portion of the German army and led to 264 soldiers being taken prisoner. The Germans on the first hill fell back to another hill named Jackalswater. The commandos pursued them, but they were outgunned and 43 commandos were captured. Botha declined to follow up the attack and Frankie withdrew, destroying the railroad tracks between them to delay Botha from advancing. With the South Africans grounded at the moment, Frankie decided to go on the offensive. While this theater of the war felt more like a 19th century conflict, with railroad and artillery being the most employed technologies, the Battle of Trekopis featured two major 20th century inventions that decided its outcome. An airplane was used to gather intelligence of Botha's troops so Frankie could decide where to strike. This information led him to choose the Trekopis railroad station. On April 25th at 5.40 a.m., troops under the command of Major Ritter cut the railroad tracks and bombarded South African troops under the command of Colonel Skinner. At 7 a.m., the troops advanced and the battle turned into a stalemate with six hours of bitter fighting. The outcome was decided by another 20th century innovation, a South African armored car with mounted machine guns. The Germans were forced to retreat. This battle would be the last time they go on the offensive. Meanwhile, the eastern and southern campaigns were also simultaneously happening. Through Botswana, a column of troops invaded the eastern borders of the German colony and did not encounter any enemy. For the southern campaign, troops that had been building up in Luteritz began marching north with the goal to link up with Batha and Windhoek, the colony's capital. The limited German troops in this part of the colony decided to evacuate the colonists and retreat to Windhoek. As the South Africans advanced through abandoned farms and small towns, the Germans were always one step ahead of them. In the small village of Kubis, the two forces briefly met with the greatly outnumbered Germans deciding to abandon the civilians they were escorting and tactically retreat. The German commander, Captain Kleist, decided to retaliate with an attack. His plan was to lure the South Africans out of Kubis and ambush them. Several of his soldiers rode into the village one morning and fired their guns in the air to rouse the South Africans and then fled. Unfortunately for them, the South Africans decided not to pursue. Perhaps part of the reason they chose not to take the bait was because they found an uncut telephone in the village and were able to listen in on German communications. They learned that Kleist was ordered to evacuate his men via train to a small town called Gibeon on April 28th. South African commandos rushed to get ahead of the train and blew up the tracks so it was stranded. But Kleist refused to surrender. His men left the train and set up defensive positions where drainage ditches next to the tracks were utilized as trenches. When the South African commandos rode into battle, they were cut down by furious blasts of machine gun fire. 24 men were killed and more than 100 were wounded. This conflict turned into a stalemate for the rest of the day, with neither side able to break the other. When darkness fell, Captain Kleist launched a Hail Mary offensive to break his men out. Some would escape to link up with the rest of the German army, while 12 were killed, 11 were wounded, and 180 were captured. Frankie continued his withdrawal inland while blowing up railroad tracks and poisoning water wells in his wake. By May, it became clear to the South Africans that the Germans were moving north and abandoning their capital at Windhoek. Botha decided to break away from the northern forces with a motorized contingent and he went to Windhoek in person to capture the small city and accept its surrender. The eastern and southern forces linked up with him here and together they went to join the northern wing to pursue the remaining German forces. South African veterans remember this march as being one of the most difficult phases of the conflict. It was done during an unusually cold winter with nighttime temperatures often dropping below freezing. Frankie continued his objective to preserve his military forces, but Botha's net was closing in. Frankie did not know he was overwhelmingly outnumbered and Botha didn't know how small the German forces really were, but both leaders were determined to fight. Frankie concentrated his forces near Sumeb. 
A small detachment broke off under the command of Major Ritter with the intention to take defensive positions and delay the South Africans for a few days so the Germans could entrench themselves. This would culminate in the Battle of Atevi on July 1st. But because the German line was so thin, the battle lasted for hours instead of days and was a decisive South African victory. Frankie concentrated his forces at Horab Farm and he was quickly surrounded by more than 13,000 South African troops. By July 5th, both sides were ready for a final battle. But Botha and Frankie both understood that the outcome would be a slaughter of the Germans. Negotiations began and on July 8th, Frankie, Colonial Governor Seitz, and 4,740 German soldiers surrendered. Botha would return to South Africa as a hero, and some of his forces would remain to occupy the captured German colony, while others would be transferred to East Africa to fight the Germans there. When World War I ended, the German colony was given to South Africa as a protectorate. It became a de facto province and would share the next 60 years of history together. A lot of that history is ugly with more colonialism practices and the development of the apartheid system. The South African military would occupy this land until March 21, 1990, when the former colony of German Southwest Africa became the Independent Republic of Namibia.